Hi, this is Carlton Mills from London, England, and I would like to share with you my thoughts in a series of studies on the subject of eschatology, primarily from the books of Daniel and Revelation. This is not a chapter-by-chapter -chapter study, but rather a general overview identifying the highlights. This fourth study is entitled Name in Names. Our general texts are Daniel chapter 12 verses 9 to 10. It reads, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And Revelation chapter 1 verses 1 to 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So reads God's holy word. In the previous study, Notorious Nations, we saw the various visions Daniel was given in describing their distinctive characteristics and scope of rule. And, to remove any ambiguity, bar one, those nations are now identified by their names. Babylon is the first kingdom. It is the fine gold head of the first vision. Babylon is also the lion with eagle's wings, its wings plucked and been made to stand on its feet and given a man's heart, which clearly means that of all the empires, Babylon and its king Nebuchadnezzar was the most noble. Maybe he was even converted to Judaism. For, as Daniel said, you are this head of gold. Media and Persia is the second kingdom that follows, even in Daniel's lifetime. That kingdom is described as the silver breasts and arms in the first vision. In the second vision it is the bear raised up on one side with three ribs in its mouth. And finally in the third vision it is actually identified as the ram, destroyed by the goat. King Cyrus the Persian and Darius the Mede being the distinguished names. Greece, the third kingdom, is the belly and thighs of the first vision and the four-winged, four-headed leopard of the second vision, finally identified in chapter 8 as the violent goat in the third vision that is subsequently divided into four kingdoms, Alexander the Great being the distinguished name. The fourth kingdom is the legs of iron with feet of iron and clay in the first vision, and in the second vision is the dreadful beast with ten horns and the other little horn with eyes and a mouth speaking blasphemy against the God of heaven. This beast is not revealed by name to Daniel. However, we can identify it in light of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy and the angel's words to John in Revelation chapter 17, which brings us into the New Testament and the Roman Empire, Julius Caesar being the distinguished name. However, because the iron and clay and the fourth beast is not actually named, we do not limit the fourth kingdom to the literal Roman Empire. The fourth kingdom continues to the end, moving progressively through all the toes of the image and the horns of the dreadful beast representing the many European powers that have ruled following the fall of Western Rome. Napoleon Bonaparte, the self-anointed Emperor of France, being a distinguished name post-Rome. And, as we see, the aberration of the eleventh little horn that shall arise is none other than Antichrist, first as the last nation that comes out of European progeny, then, finally, in the individual head of that nation, being the supreme element of the beast that is distinguished as the persecuting power of God's people during a fixed period symbolically stated as a time and times and the dividing of time. We remember that this beast was of particular interest to Daniel because of his extreme violence and unnatural elements. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Daniel chapter 7 verse 28. We cannot help observe that the golden head of the statue implies the noble attribute of reason whilst the legs and toes of iron and clay implies the ignoble use of brute force. The wings of the eagle and the lion body of the first beast implies kingly nobility, whilst the dreadful, terrible, exceeding strong attributes of the fourth beast 
implies brutality. Therefore, as the least noble in the iron and clay and the monstrous fourth beast, we see the destructive nature of the European nations. For although not often the inventors of destructive things, they certainly are the masters of destruction in the further development and use of things such as the cannonball, the varied types of gun, the many bombs, the atomic bomb, chemical and biological warfare, eugenics, the abominable transatlantic African slave trade, colonialism, two world wars, and the Holocaust. Think about the teaching of evolution denying a creator, such thinking that the ancient Greeks and Romans would turn in their graves at such folly. The West is also the driving force behind the moral decadence in promoting LGBTQ plus rights, the sacrificing of children in the womb, profiteering from pornography, such degeneracy that doubtless the people of Sodom and Gomorrah would drop their jaws in shock horror, incredulous as to why such things are done. This is our European brother of the family of man, as he has striven and continues to strive by any subtle and violent means deemed necessary to dominate the world. And whilst as the iron element of the toes he strives to bind himself with the clay he fails to do so, because despite his efforts to impose his ideologies upon the other nations of the world, he cannot quite get them to adhere to his ways, such as, for example, LGBTQ plus rights that is so fervently rejected by non-Western countries. And so, when we consider that prophets describe Babylon and Persia as cruel, and considering Daniel describes Babylon as gold and Persia as silver, materials inherently superior to iron and clay, the blood runs cold and the mind boggles to think how cruel our European brother really is. The fifth kingdom is God's kingdom. God's kingdom is the final and eternal kingdom of the stone that was cut out without hands, and of one called the Ancient of Days, who gives the kingdom to one called the Son of Man. Unlike the other kingdoms, whose power is transferred from the previous kingdom, God's kingdom is principally established spiritually in the first advent of Christ during the time of the existing fourth beast, as seen in Daniel chapter 7, and shall be physically established at Christ's second coming, as seen in Daniel chapter 2. Even as Jesus said, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Mark chapter 1 verse 15. It should therefore not go unnoticed that the kingdom of God, i.e. the ecclesia, comprising born-again Jews and Gentiles as a distinct entity is separate from the worldly power structure. And in the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15, what concord has Christ with Belial? We ought to have nothing to do with the beast's politics. Closing Vision In chapters 10 to 12, Daniel is given a grand finale of the visions. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar, and a thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. Chapter 10, verse 1. This time it is not the angel Gabriel, but the pre-incarnate Christ. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. Chapter 10, verse 14. Christ informs Daniel what he and the archangel Michael shall do. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I shall show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael your prince. Chapter 10 verses 20 to 21. In chapter 11, Christ continues his speech to the end of chapter 12 in the book. The explanation is very complicated, as it speaks distinctly about the end of the Persian and Greek empires, and although rather mysteriously, speaking of the two powerful dynasties that battled for supremacy following the death of Alexander the Great and the breakup of his kingdom, the king of the south, who historians refer to as the Ptolemy dynasty of Egypt, and the king of the north, who historians refer to as the Seleucid Kingdom, 
in which the infamous Antiochus IV Epiphanes reigns, as seen in chapter 8, and whose exploits are undoubtedly a precursor to Antichrist. The vision extends to the very end of the world. We know this because verses 1 to 3 of chapter 12 speak plainly, including references to the general resurrection and the final eternal states. The politics, machinations, alliances, coups, betrayals, lies, deceptions, murders, corruptions, blasphemies, idolatries and plundering are revealed, all now history. However, based on the principle that Scripture interprets Scripture, I believe the details future to Daniel and some things now history to us is not found in Scripture, and whilst we do not dismiss secular historical records, I believe we must content ourselves with a general outline of Daniel's visions, subject to what we might further learn in the book of Revelation. The book closes in verses 5 to 13 of chapter 12, with the angel giving Daniel some final revelation respecting the troubles that shall befall the world of men and the rather mysterious references to the time duration. But Daniel is comforted in knowing that God's holy people shall prevail to the end. We are now some 2,600 years on from Daniel's time. Daniel didn't understand. But are we any nearer to understanding? Only the wise shall understand. Are you and I one of them? Before closing, I must add a footnote with respect to the King of the North and the King of the South. I must admit, I've always been at a loss with my bearings, and short of having a compass on my forehead or on my right hand, I couldn't grasp the meaning of North and South. Recently, watching a Seventh-day Adventist webinar, the pastor simply said North and South relative to Israel, and immediately the penny dropped. So I'm indebted to Seventh-day Adventist pastor Damien Chambers for enlightening me. Subsequent study has given me clarity. So we bear in mind that biblically, in relation to Earth's poles, north, south, east and west is not relative to the secular bearings of Greenwich in Britain, but to Israel, and probably the Temple Mount. And as we see in Revelation chapter 12, spiritual Israel is the very centre of the universe. Study 5 shall follow. Thanks for listening. God willing, I shall have another message for you next time. God bless you.